Howdy, Game Methuselah. I want to do a video um, on something I tend to avoid, and that is how to create and run your campaigns. Now, I give you the technical ease on the running the creatures and running the NPCs and the drama, because I think I've expressed to you that the most important thing in role-playing to me is the drama. Uh, the second most important thing is the people you get to meet while you role-play. Uh, most of my friends have all been accumulated from my role-playing experiences over the past four decades. Uh, you meet a lot of really interesting people, and it's lots of fun. I do kind of like the living games like, you know, Adventure League and the living, you know, Forgotten Realms, the living uh, Greyhawk. Those were all ones I played because you could meet people and acquire friends there, but none like what you acquire at house games. When after you play, you all go out to eat and discuss the game and have a great time, and eventually you end up becoming friends and doing things outside of just basic role-playing, and before you know it, you're lifelong friends. And that's the best part of the gaming for me. The other part, again, like I said, is the drama. I, you know, how people feel like that was an amazing game. And that's something that I keep stressing in my games. Combats are difficult. There's always some kind of drama, uh, some point to either save the day or fail. You know, these are the things that are important. But simply enough, people keep asking me, you know, where do I start in a campaign? And, you know, I, I tell people... Basically, back in the Dark Age, we didn't know, so we all made it up. Like a lot of people, you, you kind of draw your own overlay. You had things when the Fantasy Trip came out and we switched over to hexagons, we would use hexagon maps. But previously to that, lots of the Dungeons and Dragons maps you would see, and I don't know whether you can see because of the glare, but there you just draw them. And though you were really fascinated because you really wanted to make these adventure sites really unique, Mostly they were tedious, and after a while I kind of learned that one place is pretty much the same as another. It's the bad guys you build, and the battles that are fought, and the dramas that take place, that really make it really good. Now, if I had to start over and I wasn't going to run my Albion campaign, or I wasn't going to run in ancient Greece, or I wasn't going to do Empire of the Petal Throne, I would kind of look at it and say, alright, if it's still going to be mine, there's lots of basic maps out there. The Horn people made lots of maps, lots of cities, things you didn't have to reinvent the wheel with. But still simply enough, if you're brand new, you'll want to stay with either the Paizo 3.57 or 3.75 or their second edition, which I have not looked at, because they make a lot of campaign information. So does Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons. So what you have is things like this, where they're gazetteers. And these were really great, because this is like Living Greyhawk. This was 3 and 3.5 when I played the Living Games. And I found these and really got into them because they were great things to give your players. If you were never going to DM or and run the game, it was always good to have something where you could buy the color. Now that one there is is third edition, so you might not be looking at that. Other game systems constantly, like Dark Sun. This is a fourth edition module, but they're, I think, going to bring it back in fifth if they've not already done so. And you're going to be able to see all kinds of different games. There's Ravenloft, all these campaign settings that exist. Now, the one that's currently coming up is Forgotten Realms. That's the one that people are playing in fifth edition. Now, I'm going to show you something out of second edition because I thought it was pretty amazing. It's a large box set of the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Now these things you can buy, and this is where you pick your world. You, and in the fifth edition one, you can do the same. You are going to run a campaign that likely will barely appear on the world map. And from first level to 20th level, you know, yeah, they may travel around, but whatever influence you're going to make as a game master is going to be very small initially. So you find an area that you like, you get a little pinpoint, and then you either steal a city, or use a town, or make up your own village or thorpe, and you have some place to start your game. If you want a big dungeon crawl, they used to make these things like this. This is a real <laughs> incredible dungeon. This was something that came out for in the Ruins of Undermountain, and I never ran it, because it was too massive even for me to try. I'm going to show you the first level map. This is it, first level. Every square, and I'm sure at this rate you can't even see the squares, every square is 10 feet. 
I cannot imagine how anybody would ever get through the first level of this dungeon, let alone the three additional maps they give you to run all kinds of different adventures. Now they filled it with their old monsters and their own camel paints and their little baddies and everything else, and they had a random encounter chart so you could see things that would randomly roll in the adventures and, and things, and the dungeon would sort of populate itself. And then they said, well, after explosions or after special things, you would have certain things happen. And then there were obviously certain rooms that obviously had some big bad that the players could face. It's really nice for a dungeon crawl. And I actually recommend that even if you draw your own, and it's fun to do, make your own dungeons and always have a dungeon the players can fall through. Because sometimes, you know, they're not really emboldened or maybe half the people don't show up or some of the critical people for an adventure or mission don't ha are unable to play. You can always fall back to a dungeon crawl. And dungeon crawls are great because the thing about a dungeon is it always changes. They go in, they wipe out one section of the dungeon. Well, now it repopulates with something else. Maybe some dark undead or necromancer suddenly comes in and cleans up all the dead bodies and converts them into zombies. Nothing like you know, zombie trolls always makes it for an interesting going. But that allows for a lot of interesting things. Your, your, your dungeon can always just keep repopulating and become different things and grow and expand and change. And this makes fun nights when you don't want to use your brain and really follow the missions that are driving the campaign forward. The other thing about it is you don't have to draw any of this. The beautiful thing about the books now with the maps and the little adventures is they come. And even if you look at the adventure and you say, eh, not really what I want to do, change it. Now, Matt Coville is kind of linked now with Colorel the Vile, which I think was from a fourth edition module called uh, Keep on the Shadowlands. I might be wrong, but if you do, somebody will correct me. And he changed it. He reskinned the campaign mission and made it different. And he made Colorel the Vile very, very special based upon something he had an idea for. Now, the problem, of course, is he can't keep expanding on that into the future because, well, he doesn't own the right to that character. Oops. But the idea was you make the game your own. And I know you've heard this from me. Always make the games your own. But don't do the work. That campaign gave you multiple maps for the underground. So you didn't have to draw anything or prepare anything. All you did was have to concentrate on the drama, on that that versimilitude situation that makes the game feel real to the players. And you can add your own things, which I always recommend, but use the stuff that's there. Now, if you want to draw maps, if you love drawing maps, if you want to draw your cities and towns and villages, and you want to draw your big overland, please do. Matt's done it because, well, he writes in books about this world, and he wants to have it all fresh in his mind, plus he wants things he can look at that inspire him to keep doing so. If you want to do that, do it as well, because there is a lot of fun in developing your own campaigns. But once again, the minimalist game master like me wants to grab all the things I can to just make the drama really nice, make it as visually beautiful as I can. You've seen my dungeon tiles. You've surely seen the thousands of miniatures I've, I've painted. Well, maybe not thousands of you've seen, but a few that I put out there for you to look at. But I want to be able to present the game, make it exciting, make it interesting, and do this as fast as I can because it's not Albion. It, Albion, I design all the undergrounds myself, and I make them myself because they're unique to something that I see and I feel. So that, like Matt's, it's part of my story. And as I'm writing the book and writing the idea for the Twilight of Fae, I want it to be unique to me. But if you just want to play, and I think most of you do, start with 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, or go to the Pazio and use their original 3.7 Pathfinder, or you know, look at their new second edition rules, which is more likely what you should do because that's what they're going to be writing in the future for, and see if it's playable for you. They've done a lot of good in making a lot of modules. My friend Craig runs a module from Pazio Pathfinder, and he converted it to 5th edition D&D, but it goes right across, and that's the beauty of buying campaign settings. They're not going to go out of date. I don't know if you've ever heard or seen, I have Earth Dawn. Now, Earth Dawn 
was a fabulous colored system where the idea that demons came every thousand years and all the humans were forced into an underground world where for a hundred years they had to basically hide while the demons ravished the earth. And they have these little clocks and little devices that said how horrible the chaotic threat was and when they could come out. And at some point the game starts where the people are coming out of their lairs 100, 150, 200 years later after they've gone in there. Generations of people have never seen the world and have no idea what's out there. So as a game master, it's a perfect foil for you to just produce anything you want because anything is unique. And they suddenly find a new underground vault where these people were locked in and, well, are they humans that they're going to get to rescue? Or were they broken into monsters 200 years ago and filled with all kinds of unspeakable beasts? It's really excellent. And there's maps and there's lots of companion things. So you can pick and then keep thinking of it as a microscope. You start with a little one tower and then you go down to five times and ten times. And every time you get smaller and smaller, the world becomes more and more yours. Where you're designing the villages and the towns and the undergrounds and the adventure locations and the dungeons and everything you want. And as the players grow and expand, you can start grabbing larger and new modules to come in and play with. And that's what I do. I utilize the microcosm of stuff I have already done or things I want to do and produce little area adventures. And then as I expand, I look what's out there and I pull it in and I read it, I utilize the map, I change the stuff to suit me. So if it's not exactly the way I want it, I change the villain. Well, maybe this guy died. Maybe some other party came in here last week and murdered him. So now there's a new bad guy who's taken the place. Maybe these players were bad guys and now they're running the world. So it all can change to suit what you want to run for your players. More importantly, what your players want to run themselves. And as I tell people, and I think something that Mac Mercer is really good to, listen to what your players are saying about their characters. Then sculpt your games and your campaigns to fit into their characters. In the fourth edition Albion game we were running, Craig was running this character. It was half Fomorian really unique sort of thunder warrior and it was kind of cool so I was building lots of things around his character and thusly other people had characters and they would describe them so I would give them you know bits and pieces of tits tidbits and and notes and things that they might only know that the other players wouldn't know and that's what you can do all the time to make your campaign both unique and easy but once again the idea don't draw it all if you don't want to. Go out there and find something. Find maps that other people have drawn. Just go on the internet. There's thousands of maps of dungeons that people have drawn. Just download a few. You've got them. Change them if you need to. Change them if you want to change them later. Maybe if you use it as a dungeon and it's going to expand, you're going to want to add on to it. But in the meantime, just use it. Prepare your basic adventures or use something that's there and get started. It's not hard. And your bad guys can start out small and little, and they can evolve as the player characters evolve. And it makes for an ongoing campaign, because I can tell you, the more work you do in the beginning, the more frustrated you're going to be when your players make a left turn and they go off into the, a different part of the world than you ever expected and they want to play something that was just a sideline to you that you weren't even going to think about and they don't want to play your main adventure at all because those guys don't sound anywhere near as cool as these guys do. So let the players evolve your game. Let them run their characters and utilize them to make your game move forward. Let enemies hate them, where their characters now have missions because family members are kidnapped or anything, and I've come up with tons and tons, or some demon they've offended now is sending imps out there to devastate the little village that they call home. Then they have to make decisions. Are we heroes? Are we going to protect these people? Or are we just, you know, murder hobos and we're going to move on someplace where it's safer and then go collect our gold and treasure and grow up from that point? It's all up to them, and you let them drive it, and it makes it for a fun campaign. As you guys know, I love the Ares magazine Albion so much that I'm building and have built and run campaigns for years, and now working on a book situation that I can get out there so other people can run it, all based upon the ancient elven world of Albion and how the elves at one time ruled the world, and as their control shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, how do they survive? And do they? So, you know, 
just get something started, grab onto something, maybe it's a novel, maybe it's Lord of the Rings, great thing, Middle Earth role-playing games were super fun, they provided all kinds of campaign background data that made it really exciting if you were a, a Tolkien fan, you could look into that, but find something you like, I think there's a game called The One Ring, where I'm not sure it's even playable by someone like me, because it isn't really a, a combat-based system, but boy, they've got lots of Lord of the Ring color in there and some beautiful artwork. Something to look into. Grab something that excites you. Start running a campaign. If you want to use 5th edition, do it. Forgotten Realms is so vast and there's so much material out there and they're making so much every day that you can play more than likely for the rest of your life and never get out of that one campaign setting. So give it a try. Until we have a chance to speak again, fight me, devils, fight, for I hate peace. Game on.